one with the king. The Arctic history is long, but it bends towards participatory democracy. Prague <laughs> Spring and the uprisings in Eastern Europe in the 60s and 70s were violently corrupt. But 20 years later, the Soviet Union was displaced. And the reason for that is it does take time to instill democratic institutions. It does take time to displace entrenched dictators and the deep military state that they, that they rely on. But despite that, that doesn't mean that we regret the, the preliminary advances that are fundamental to achieving those benefits. So what we're going to do at the Oakley Opposition is take the long game. We're going to show you why the Arab Spring was a critical awakening that would lead to sustainable democratic institutions in the Middle East. It might not happen immediately, it might not happen this year, but ultimately this is the most critical transformation the Arab world has had in the last 150 years. So, let's turn to some rebuttal first. What we have in the opposition is it's really like simplistic metric. You know, has it caused more harm than good? But the problem is that's an incredibly short-term calculus when looking at the Arab Spring. We've shown you that major social transformations take time. You don't just click your fingers and have democracy. To have democracy, you need voting, you need media, you need civil society groups, you need a culture of democracy. All those things take time, but they're accelerated when you have a ballot, when you have a leader in place, when you have the people knowing that they can replace someone who doesn't honour the democratic measure. We think that's fundamental. But what they pointed to is this idea of democratic dictatorship instilling stability. The problem with that is that it's illusory stability. The thing about dictatorships is that it looks really, really stable until they're suddenly swept away. Like, no one thought Mubarak was going to get swept away. But the point is, he had no actual support within the population. So it's immensely quick. So for the West to pin their hopes on vacuum dictates is disastrous. Because all it means is that we end up getting blamed for all the abuses of that state that we funnel aid into. We think that's a pathetic approach for the West that claims to be committed to principles like democracy, like participation. We're happy to stand against that. No. What we have in the opposition is this kind of list of some of the problems that have occurred under the status quo. They point to the example of Syria. We don't believe that Syria is actually an embodiment of the Arab Spring. As Ambassador Ryan Crocker said, who was the ambassador to Iraq and to Afghanistan, Syria is a long-running sectarian dispute that has bedeviled Lebanon, ladies and gentlemen, and has bedeviled Iraq. With its quite distinct from the organic right, movements we saw in places like Egypt right, and Tunisia. Yeah, yeah. But even if we were to argue that Syria is an example of the Arab Spring, it's weird to say we support dictators because they have killed a hundred thousand people since the day that the Arab Spring happened. Like, if that's the kind of stability you want, where these dictators villainously murder anyone who has any opposition to them, ladies and gentlemen, that's a really sustainable solution. That's not really sustainable. <laughs> we can down the track what that leads to is worse bloodshed, worse violence, and less capacity for these people to ever transition from No. Then we heard, well look, we haven't had proper democracy in a lot of these places. And we agree with that, ladies and gentlemen. But let's be very clear, the critical thing about the recent uprisings in Cairo was 14 million people said the Muslim Brotherhood cannot be in power and subvert democracy. They can't write a constitution that excludes people. They can't write a constitution that means that they're not subject to democratic accountability and the courts can't scrutinise them. We think what's going to happen in, in, in Egypt, frankly, is these uprisings are going to continue against the army if they try to hold on to power at the, at the expense of people having the opportunity to actually participate. The opposition can't just say we've frozen at this point in time it hasn't worked. Like, sure it hasn't. But what the people have shown in uprising after uprising is that they won't stand for a government that doesn't deliver participatory democracy. We think that's pretty clear. Yes, Joe? the long game, then why do you support premature revolutions that occurred before there was a genuine opposition? Okay, let's be really clear about this. How do you get a genuine opposition with a dictator? The problem after Mubarak got the place is that there wasn't any opposition. The only opposition was the Muslim Brotherhood that could organise in mosques, that could build its own networks, that could give people shit in exchange for power. <laughs> when you have elections, you have like a thousand political parties get formed. And you know what? They make mistakes, they develop a different speed. But what they do is they start developing a framework where viable opposition candidates like Wael Halei, like, like um, Al Baraday, start to develop and have the capacity to gain some popular credibility. It takes time, but the Muslim Brotherhood's premature advantage evaporates pretty quickly. Like in the in the EBC, they're the most organized, quickly, quickly capable organization. We think that more liberal parties will become stronger. And we've seen that in Libya, where there's a Libyan National Council, which is largely liberal, ladies and gentlemen. Not every example is negative. So let's look at what the Arab Spring has actually done. We don't think we think it's crucial in opening opposition not to skirt over how horrendous some of these regimes are. 
If you look at Hosnia Mubarak and his secret police, well, I guess it wasn't that secret, we saw <laughs> mass torture, mass murder, the deprivation of rights, and also the playing off of ethnic groups to secure advantages. So it's a bit rich for the opposition to talk about you know, the, the, the impact on minority groups and things like that, ladies and gentlemen. Because ultimately, what Mubarak would do is, where, where appropriate, he'd allow violence against Coptic Christians when he needed to reach out to certain allies. When appropriate, he'd allow violence against another group when the military wanted that. We think that those types of governments had no interest in the inclusive state which gave anyone fundamental rights. All they cared about was their power, ladies and gentlemen. We have the same thing in Tunisia. So what we think, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem with that is you destroy the economy, you destroy uh, the capacity of people to participate, you kill people, you torture people. These are disastrous things, ladies and gentlemen. And simply because Egypt and Tunisia aren't perfect now doesn't mean those advances shouldn't be recognised. What we've also seen in other countries is major reforms. So in Morocco, we've seen key reforms towards constitutional democracy. In Kuwait, we've had people, the government have to share the proceeds of the oil boom to ensure more people could profit from that. These are real significant advances. And what they show is that participation matters. That's a crucial message for dictators in this region. In the past, they could rely on their deep state and assume that the army could suppress any protest. Right now, they know, looking at the precedent of every other country, they get swept away in a minute, shackled, tried, and put away, or killed, ladies and gentlemen. That's a pretty bloody good message. Moreover, this is a crucial pathway towards the inclusive strike. So let's be clear what we want here. We're not expecting a liberal democracy. No one accepts that. What we accept is some measure of accountability at the balance of We think it's crucial that governments are responsible to the needs of their people and accountable for their performance. Whether that means that they do is, you know, uh, propagating the Islamic view of how society should be organized or not, we think those things are fundamental. The benefit of the Arab Spring is, as I've said before, it placed dictators on notice of the just, but it also helped to develop civil society. It helped to develop opposition groups. It helped to develop a resistance, ladies and gentlemen. It developed a culture where it's no longer good enough for a, a, a government to do whatever it wanted to keep power without any form of reprisal. Moreover, it's, it's attracted foreign capital, ladies and gentlemen. Unless you're in an industry where consumer pressure doesn't matter at all, it's pretty bloody bad working with Hosni Mubarak or working with Ben Ali, ladies and gentlemen. We think in those climates, it's better to have democratic institutions develop We think have to destroy foreign countries. Ultimately, this debate is about 10, 20, 30 years right from now. Where are the right countries?